Hi. So in this video, we're going to discuss about the movements of small intestine. So this question has been asked multiple times as a short note in many university exams. So we'll see how we can approach this for an exam. So we can first describe the movements of the small intestine under two headings. The first is motor activity in the fed state and the motor activity in the interdigestive period, that is in the fasting period. Okay. So movements of small intestine can be in the fed state or in the fasting state. So the first example of a movement that occur in the fed state is mixing movements. And a very good example for mix, mi mixing movement is segmentation contractions which occur in the small intestine. So suppose this is a small intestine, what happens is in segmentation contraction, there will be con constrictions of the muscle layer at regular intervals. So what will happen? The foot that is present will be broken down into segments, right? And then in the next time, there will be contractions in other areas, while the areas that were initially contracted will be relaxed. So now what will happen? There will be mixing of the kind. So see here you can see that the segments have got mixed up, right? So this is called mixing movements and the good example is segmentation contraction. So here in this type of movement, there will not be any forward movement of this food, but there will be proper mixing of the food, right? So in segmentation contraction, a tonic contraction ring appears and divide the lumen into segments. Okay, that is why it is called segmentation contraction. And after some time, the segments will relax and new contraction rings will appear. So this allows the chyme to be chopped and mixed with the intestinal fluid. So that is meant by segmentation contraction. Now the next important motor activity in the fed state is peristalsis. This is very important because this peristalsis as such can be asked as a short note. So peristalsis, it not only occurs in the small intestine, it occurs throughout the GI tract. And we know it is a propulsive movement. Right from deglutition, we know that peristalsis will help the uh, foot to move forward. Okay. So suppose this is the GI tract. What happens is if there is a bolus or if there is a foot here, there will be constriction ring just before the bolus and there will be a relaxation just after that. So the bolus will be able to move forward. Right. So the contractile ring appears around the gut and then this contractile ring will move forward causing the bolus to push forward. So we have to know the mechanism of peristalsis in much detail. So see this is the diagram which clearly shows the enteric nervous system. We know in the enteric nervous system we've got two types of neurons which is the submucosal plexus and the myentric plexus. And it is a myentric plexus that helps in the motility of the GI tract. So how does myentric plexus help in the motor to the GI tract? See, suppose we've got a bolus here. Now the presence of this bolus will be detected by the chemoreceptors and the osmoreceptors and the mechanoreceptors here. And this will cause distension of the wall of the GI tract. Now this will be sensed by these sensory neurons, especially the interchromaffin-like sensory neurons. And this in turn will inform the myentric neurons by releasing the hormone serotonin okay so the sensory neurons or the entrochromaffin like neurons will release serotonin and this serotonin will act on these myentric neurons which in turn so see you can see that there are two types of myentric neurons one is the anterograde and the other is the retrograde so the suppose this is the circular muscle layer what happens is this neurons that is the anterograde neurons will release acetylcholine which will cause constriction of the circular muscle layer here. So what will happen? The part of the bolus just part of the circular muscle just before the bolus will be constricted because of the release of acetylcholine. Right? And what about the other end? In the retrograde end what happens is they re release the neurotransmitter nitric oxide which will cause relaxation of the segment just after the bolus. So that is how this contractile ring is formed before the bolus and there is relaxation after the bolus. So this is the role of myentric plexus in peristalsis. So see, the foot bolus in the intestinal lumen is sensed by the interchromaffin-like cells of the intestinal mucosa which release serotonin. The serotonin binds on to the receptors of the intrinsic neuron that when activated initiate the peristaltic reflex in that segment of the small intestine. 
Behind the bolus, excited to neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, substance P and neuropeptide Y are released in the circular muscle. Whereas in front of the bolus, inhibitory pathways that is uh, NO and vasointestinal peptide are activated in the circular muscle. So thus, we know that myotrich plexus play the major role in peristalsis. Here you can add on some more points to show the role of myotrich plexus. One is that a congenital absence of myotrich plexus as it occurs in Hirschsprung's disease, there will be no peristalsis in such cases because myotrich plexus is a major controller of peristalsis. So that is why effectual peristalsis require an active myotrich plexus. Now the peristaltic waves move towards the anus with downstream receptive relaxation and this is called the law of cut. See, the movement of the bolus will always occur from the oral to the anal end. Okay, and even if the intestine is sutured back in the opposite way, still the movement is to, will be towards the original anal end. That is because these myotrich neurons are polarized, and that is why it always moves in one direction, and that is called the law of gut. So the reason for the law of gut is that the myotrich plex is polarized in the anal direction. That is why the peristaltic reflex is also called myotrich reflex. Okay, because uh, myotric plexus plays such a huge role in peristalsis. So see we've said a lot about peristalsis. We uh, moved in detail about what peristalsis is and what the mechanism of peristalsis is and we also told about the role of myotric plexus. Now moving back to the small intestinal motility. The next type of movement in the fed state is movement of this intestinal mucosa and the villi. See, we know that there are small villi in the small intestine, right? So, the intestinal mucosa moves back and forth across the circular muscle layer. That is for proper mixing of the intestinal juice with the spine. Not only that, the villi will show shortening movements as well as there will be swaying of the villi, right? And it will stir the contents of the lumen against the epithelial surface. So, all these movements will help in proper mixing of the intestinal contents with the spine. Moving on to the next type of motor activity that is motor activity in the fasting period. See in the fasting period we've got a special type of motor activity which is called the migrating motor complexes or MMCs. So what is meant by this migrating motor complexes? See when the GIT or the GI tract is empty as in the once the, all the food is digested and absorbed the GI tract will be empty right. During this time a ring of contraction appears at one point in the digestive tract and then it sweeps over the entire length of the intestine. Then another ring of contraction will appear in some other point. Okay, So these contractions are called migrating. It's called migrating because each time, each time the contraction will occur at different points. So that is why it is called migrating motor complexes. Why do we need such migrating motor complexes? So the function of that is if there are any remaining food particles, debris or secretions, it is cleared from the intestine. And that is why it is called the housekeeper of the GI tract. So, migrating motor complexes are called the housekeeper of the GI tract. So, next we will move on to the regulation of intestinal motility. So, just like in many other areas, here also we have got two types of regulation. One is a neural regulation and the other is a hormonal regulation. So, we will discuss about the neural regulation first. See, in all this motility, we said that it is the enteric nervous system which plays a very important role. So, see, suppose this is the enteric nervous system which includes the submucosal and the myentric plexus. See, and we said that we have got these sensory neurons which will uh, send the impulse of the presence of bolus or food in the GI tract. Okay. Now, this enteric nervous system is also influenced by extrinsic nervous system such as the autonomic nervous system. So, we've got the parasympathetic system which uh, synapses onto the myentric as well as submucosal plexus and thereby regulate the motility. Not only parasympathetic, we've got the sympathetic system also which in turn decreases the intestinal motility and makes the body ready for the flight or fright response. So, uh, what are the components of neural regulation? One, stretching of the muscle. See, as I said, the sensory neurons can detect the presence of bolus inside the gut and thereby it can increase the motility. Next, stimulation by acetylcholine released from the endings of the parasympathetic nerves. So, parasympathetic system 
they release acetylcholine and thereby increase the intestinal motility as we know parasympathetic system is for rest and digest so it will enhance the intestinal motility and uh, what what does sympathetic nerves do they secrete mainly non epinephrine and they decrease the peristalsis okay so a sympathetic system is for fight or flight and thus it decreases peristalsis next we want the hormonal regulation in hormonal regulation we've got factors or hormones that enhance intestinal motility and also inhibit intestinal motility so the hormones that enhance in intestinal motility are gastrin cholecystokinin insulin and serotonin and those which inhibit intestinal motility are secretin and glucagon so those the hormones that enhance intestinal motility are gastrin cholecystokinin insulin and serotonin and those that inhibit intestinal motility are secretin and glucagon so that completes the regulation of intestinal motility next we'll quickly mention some applied aspects one is adynamic ileus what is meant by adynamic ileus the other term is called peraltic ileus and it usually occurs following an abdominal surgery so during an abdominal surgery when we handle the small intestine so much it will move on to a peraltic ileus or all the peristalsis will be stopped and that is called peraltic ileus another applied aspect is an intestinal colic what's meant by intestinal colic it's a severe abdominal cramp that are experienced in, in localized obstruction of small intestine so when there's a localized obstruction in the small intestine as as in hard feces or constipation there will be severe abdominal cramps which in turn will cause intestinal colic so that's to so when a question like movements of small intestine is asked we can first classify it and write the motor acted in the fed state which should include the mixing movements that is segmentation contractions then the peristalsis which is a propulsive movement and also movement of the intestinal mucosa and the villi and then you have to write about the motor acted in the fasting period that is migratory motor complexes and then you can write about the regulation which should include neural and hormonal and finish off with some applied aspects so i hope this concept is clear thank you